So, um, Tomas, thanks for uh, signing up for this. Um, it's it a pleasure. Very, very been in several times actually to kind of discuss what might be some good content for this. So, I appreciate your time and effort. Um, Pete, you want to chime in as usual? I always like to put Pete on the spot because Pete has worked with all these people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, Tomas has been uh, fantastic as, um, you know, a, a resource and somebody who's um, really been doing uh, some amazing stuff on the uh, accelerator side. Um, and he's he's given every um appearance of actually listening to me <laughs> when <laughs> when i uh, you know when i when i go on long rambles about all the things we need um and he seems to be delivering uh some really useful hardware um uh, in the ethos um so either he's doing a very good job of uh <laughs> You have to give kudos to the entire team. So it's just not me. Yes. We have a team here, and uh, as you saw, Felix uh, last time from the uh, more software optimization side, and we have the compiler team and test verification and everything, right? But I, yes, uh, I'm the hardware tech lead, so the RTL and the design is kind of my speciality. And and that has actually been one of the really impressive things about um, you know working with. Uh, you know, ARM in general, and especially the sort of the group in Lund, is that you do actually have this very, um, uh, you know, feels like a very co-design sort of philosophy, like you're actually sharing a lot of what you learn from, you know, um, Matt Martino on the research side, and like, you know, the software optimization synthesis NN, the hardware side, uh, which I think is really, really crucial. Like yeah. that, that makes a massive difference. Yes, uh, I would say mach machine learning uh, is really uh, a whole ecosystem. You need to take so many things into account. If you just look at one isolated item, it's not really going to work. So it's a teamwork across the in entire arm, all the way from the research team, like you say, software compiler, all the way through. And, and I think also in, in particular the site I'm coming from in Lund, we have a, a little bit of history of, of having a close collaboration between software and uh, hardware. So maybe that's a strength we have. Locally. Definitely. I mean, I've, I've definitely, like I said, I've been super impressed with, you know, the interactions we've had and actually seeing the hardware that has emerged. Um, I'm very, very excited to, uh, you know, get my hands on the silicon, um, hopefully not too long, so. <laughs> yeah, it's on, oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> looking forward to that, absolutely. Awesome, um, so to ask one of the things, um, I can certainly read the bio, but I think it's often much, much mm -hmm. better when you can talk about for the students, especially when you kind of talk about the experience of how you got into the space and sort of, you know, give a little bit of a personal take, because that's, that's sort of the thing that, you know, when they kind of hope to kind of get to, but how you end up there is sort of always room mm -hmm. for students. You know? um, so yeah, so please, when I turn it over to you, just make sure like, you know, you kind of give a little bit of that and kind of explain the ecosystem and how kind of you fit in there. And then, yeah, then you can kind of get into the uh, end of stuff. Okay. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can I, do you want me to start? I can yes, please. try to share my screen here. Is this coming through? Yeah. So excellent. So thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Thomas Edso, as you know now. I work in, with the ARM machine learning group based in Lund, Sweden. And there I've been the hardware tech lead for the design of the micro MPU product line within ARM. So really happy to present here uh, in this class. Uh, I've prepared a presentation that I call Endpoint AI and the advent of the micro MPU. And in this presentation, uh, I will cover a little bit of the definition of a micro MPU, what it is, and I'll focus a lot on what the key features you need to take into account when designing a micro MPU. And then I'll cover a little bit, an overview of the Ethos U55 micro MPU from ARM, 
and at the end I will gaze a little bit into the impact and opportunities in a world where the micro MPU will be present in the billion of uh, tiny ML devices, hopefully. So to give some background uh, on, on AI and what a micro MPU is, it's worth looking at the whole ecosystem of AI. So the ecosystem of AI, can, you can largely divide into three main domains. So the cloud, the edge, and the endpoint. And the cloud is where AI began its life. So with big algorithms uh, and big data and huge uh, training models. Uh, and here the hardware consists basically of data centers, supercomputers built out of thousands of racks of general purpose GPUs or custom tensor processing uh, units. This is a really extreme hardware. The system runs uh, with optimized networks, petabytes of storage, you're running at megawatts uh, of energy and they're built in cooling systems, sometimes water cool. So this is the extreme, right? This is for sure not a place for micro MPU and the design here is completely different. So if we look in the middle, so recently we've seen a shift from the cloud to something which is called the edge, the, sort of the edge of the cloud. And here hyperscalers like Amazon, uh, they're predicting to put millions of new edge servers on, on the network. So in, in these, you offload the cloud with workloads uh, for particular services and tends to be mainly inference, but could also be training. And here, the hardware is could be smaller versions of what exists in the cloud, but also more uh, customized solution exists uh, like NPUs specifically done for uh, inference. Still here runs with, you know, giga or uh, enormous amounts of memory uh, and usually in the kilowatts, right? An endpoint is a fairly new, new area and here the work, workload is primarily inferencing. So usually on a specialized, quantized, optimized and customized uh, network for a particular use case. And here, the hardware you run on is more microcontrollers. Memory here is in the low megabytes, even kilobytes of memory. And the power budget is completely different. It's in the micro or milliwatt, uh, low, low milliwatt digit uh, range. And this is the main that is predicted to grow a lot in the future. And this is where the micro MPU will sit in these type of small constrained systems close to a microcontroller. Um, and this is the challenging, challenging domain that has led to the advent of the micro MPU. So in this main section of the presentation, I'll talk about what are the key features of a micro MPU? How can it be this sufficient? So this is the slide I will come back to several times. So here I list the key features of the micro MPU. Let's start with the, the, the maybe the most important one. So power efficiency and power efficient convolution. That's a really key feature. So why that? Yeah, well, convolution is what dominates the most of neural networks. And most of the power comes from running the multiply accumulate the Mac. And in, in the uh, multiply accumulate, most of the power is the actual multiplication or toggling inside the multiplications, and, but also reading the operands that constitute the, the, the multiplier and the multiplication. However, convolution, as it, as it is a filter sort of uh, running across the IFM, it lends itself a lot to reuse of operands so there are two, two main things you can do. You can keep weights that you have read stable and then change the IFM operands it's, it's running on. Or you can do the opposite. You can read IFM and then change kernels that, or weights that are on top of it. And by doing this, you can minimize reading operands. You can minimize the toggling of multipliers because one input might, might be kept stable. 
And if you design specifically for this, you can keep some of this data, these operands, very close to the compute in registers, have very high local bandwidth, and then have lower bandwidth as you sort of get more distant away from, from your compute. And you can optimize these memories for power. So this is very a big portion of making a uh, NPU efficient. There are other things you can do as well. So in a traditional CPU, it might be difficult to make use of low bit width, but low bit width is something that you can introduce in models and it does not harm accuracy a lot uh, if you lower the bit, bit width in many layers. This is particularly true if you lower the bit width of the weights. Uh, research shows that if you do it on activations, it tends to be more sensitive, you lose more accuracy. So if, if your MPU is running this kind of workload, you have the opportunity to optimize your arithmetic, particularly for low bit width. Uh, also, when the, the weights are small, your local storage, where you have these, the weights I was talking about that you run across IFMs, you, you can have more of the weights. You have more local storage because the, the, the weights are smaller. So you can even more exploit that. You can also make the actual multiplier smaller and, and choose to run faster uh, because you can do more of them in, in, on a particular area. Another key thing to make a power efficient convolution is to exploit sparsity. So weights are generally sparse when you train models. It's a property of neural networks, basically. But, or they can be made even sparser by pruning. That is sort of forcing weights that are close to zero to the zero. Activations can also become sparse if your network uses the real activation function, which clamps negative values to zero. So if your hardware is specifically designed for this type of workload, you can build in general zero gating, i.e. when a zero, sort of opportunistically, when a zero comes, you don't do anything. You, you turn off the clock and you, you know the result's not gonna affect. Or if your tooling can be made to make a regular pattern of zeros, sort of like eat, out of each four weights, we know that two are zero. Then you can have hardware that sort of select them out does absolutely nothing for zeros and then run faster because you actually do less multiplications when they're filtered out. So these techniques you can do in, in, to make your power efficient convolution. The next really important thing is bandwidth efficiency. So in an actual system, in particular embedded, you always usually have a very limited bandwidth. So it's usually the performance bottleneck, or can be often be. In particular, in an embedded solution, the off-ship, if you, if you have a model in off-ship flash, that can be very slow. And also, when you actually read it, you consume a lot of power. So if your model is in flash, and, and it takes a lot of time, uh, power to read it, of course, a very efficient way would be to compress the weights so you don't access the flash very much. And that's very, a very good technique. So the weights, like I said, they are typically sparse or low bit width. So in fact, they compress very well. So a custom micro MPU, as opposed to CPU, can easily have hardware in there to decompress uh, weights, right? So if you, if you have a, a compression algorithm that exploits the pruning, the clustering of, of your weights to a few fixed values, and, and that the bit width is actually lower than eight, most of the time, more all the time, you can reach something like one to two bit per weight and still have an accuracy close to an eight bit. That's a very large uh, reduction in, in bandwidth, and it comes also then with a, a reduction in uh, power, and, and also a performance increase, as you might be limited by this. Note that the compression can be done offline, and you only need the decoder in the, the NPU, right? If you do this offline compression, you also have the option to compress the weights in the actual order used by the MPU. And that allows for the streaming of weights from the flash. And that by doing that, you make the most use of the flash because you, you get more efficiency reading in a streaming fashion. The final technique to have lower bandwidth is to support batching. This, there are layers that use a weight just once, like fully connected layers. So here you have no technique to, to uh, 
have this reuse of an operon unless you have several inferences run in parallel sort of at the same time. That is called, that is batching. However, it has a negative impact that you then need, need to actually read several inputs before you, you give them to the NPU. So for some use cases, you might not want the latency, but that's also an effective technique to lower your bandwidth. Activation compression is similar to weight compression, but here we compress the, the input feature maps and the output feature maps. We decompress the input and compress the output. So this can also exploit low bit width and sparsity similar to weights. It becomes sparse again because you might use the real loop. But here you cannot do it offline because you are producing the data inside the MPU, right? So you would need both an encoder and a decoder. And for some systems, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, it makes most sense if you actually use, uh, if your IFMs and OFMs are stored off ship as that is the most expensive in terms of power and it may, you might gain from compressing them and going off ship. If it's on ship storage of uh, OFMs and IFMs, then usually, as you cannot guarantee compression in the general case, it might be better to not compress at all. So in terms of size and complexity, you know, for smaller uh, micro MPUs, this activation compression might not be used, but for larger ones where you can't, uh, and running larger models really doesn't fit on chip, it might make more sense. A further technique to reduce bandwidth is to fuse operators. So that is avoiding a round trip between the IFM and OFM completing and doing sort of two layers at once inside the MPU. Uh, that's a very effective technique and typically uh, typical case here is when you fuse an activation function to a convolution and that also produces bandwidth and power. Finally, there's like a general technique a micro MPU can use is to have internal formats for IFMs and OFMs that are burst friendly. If the NPU is, is creating a layer and then just only consuming it itself, it can use a very an internal format which is friendly to the bus, such as aligning transfers to the, the size of the bus and using long contiguous bursts, so dividing the OFMs into blocks basically. So these are techniques that really help in, in micro MPUs. But there's another technique which. So now it's like, uh, specifically yep. I think, um, when you were mentioning the. Um, Activation functions, are there certain activation functions that you generally prefer? I mean, there's a, there's a good reason why we picked the ReLU from just an algorithmic standpoint, but if you're looking at it from a hardware sort of standpoint, would you have any different perspective on it? No, no not really. So I'll, I'll mention later that, you know, a hardware technique for implementing any type of activation function is a simple lookup table. So mm -hmm. uh, if you know you're going from 8-bit to 8-bit, it's not very costly to just support any type of activation functions and, and then it actually really doesn't matter from a hardware point of view which it is. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Uh, okay, so static analysis is another really beneficial technique that can be exploited in with a micro MPU. I mean, it's theoretically possible for, for uh, software as well, but I don't think frameworks generally support that. So if you have an offline compiler, you can have something, you know, spending a lot of cycles thinking about the best schedule on the NPU. You can balance the block sizes you compute and the order you compute them and things like that to have the best possible ba balance between bandwidth and compute. It can identify all possible opportunities to fuse layers. It can schedule, schedule prefetches from flash uh, if it knows you're going to need it later uh, and things like that. And as I already said, you, you can compress weights uh, and, and compress it in the order consumed by the MPU to make it, you know, strictly linear reads from flash. Uh, you can select these efficient memory formats when you know it's consumed by yourself. And another, the last technique, which is a little bit difficult to explain, and maybe I should have a, a figure for that, but in, in some cases, you, you can schedule a cascade across several layers, dividing it into sort of sections if, if the middle layer in a such cascade is large, but the, the beginning and the end is small, you can go from one to the other and never ever storing the larger tensor uh, in full, right? And you save footprint in SRAM. That's really important technique. Uh, and 
can be very effective to reduce the amount of working SRAM you need. So when you do an offline compiler, you get the benefit of making it possible to run in a system with actually smaller SRAM, sometimes smaller than the largest tensor. And also smaller footprint in flash because you compress the weights. You know, so you're really enabling another type of networks or more networks. Static analysis also allows the end view to have a very simple control and that means power efficient as well. So on the API of the MPU, it could be very high level, like tensor or sub, uh, sub tensor level commands. You don't need any caching or anything because you, 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 all the traffic was planned ahead, right? And it also leads to very predictable performance. Um, and Thomas, I'm going to jump off, but I was going to say that point yeah. about caches yes. is super important. Like it's something that, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize is a property of these neural networks that you can actually, caches get in the way, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, a lot yeah, of our yeah. software work is actually trying to persuade the cache to do what we know it needs to do, because mm -hmm. we know from millions of cycles ahead what the accesses are going to be, so. Yep, exactly. And that's really a, a, a big reason why we can make it so efficient. You can plan for yeah. ahead. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thanks so much. This is, this is fantastic, Thomas. Uh, and, thank uh, you. Uh, talk to you again soon. Okay, bye. Okay, so another key feature of a micro MPU uh, is security and privacy. And I believe you have a section in the course on that as well. So why do I say that? Well, the use case for uh, micro MPUs include audio and video sensors in home and public places. This is actually a very common use case. And, and often a solution with a micro MPU is preferred uh, for privacy reasons because when you use it, the data stays and gets analyzed at the endpoint and nothing is sent to the cloud. But it doesn't, that, that still means that the NPU itself needs to be secure. So just like a CPU, the NPU needs to be secure from an S software attack. So a non-secure user in this system cannot get access to secure mode NPU and re reach havoc and, and take control of the system. Uh, and uh, also the, the, the memory needs to be, uh, the system memory needs to be uh, secure from the software attack. So pre prevent the non-secure mode uh, user of the NPU to, from accessing and, and tampering with secure memory. And for this, there is a scheme in ARM which called Trust Zone, which can achieve this. And that's really important. Uh, configurability, another key feature of a micro MPU, uh, in my opinion. So if you look at the workloads on the endpoint, so there is a very large diversity of applications. So roughly you, you can divide it into the three Vs, uh, which with increasing complexity are vibration, voice, and vision. But even within such a use case, there can be layered models of complexity. So again, if we go on increasing complexity within one of these there let's take a uh, voice here there might be an always on uh, level very simple models and very power efficient just checking if there is sound and if there is a human speaking then it might go to a, like a higher power level and check could it be the keyword that was spoken and then it might fire up a, a larger portion of the mpu or a larger mpu and, and check okay was it really the keyword? Who said it? And what, what was said after the keyword, the full speech recognition? So this kind of diversity and layering leads to the need for micro MPUs with different operating points. And you may see systems having actually several different micro MPUs in the same chip. And finally, to, to have a sec successful micro MPU, it's very important that it's flexible and easy to use. So you need to support uh, popular ML frameworks, the, the popular tooling. I don't think it's a good idea <clears throat> to have um, too many proprietary tools or commercial tools in this area. You need to support a wide range of networks with the support you have in the micro MPU, all the way from multi-layer perceptrons, convolution neural networks, neural networks uh, recurrent neural networks such as LSTMs and GRUs, and more recently, transformer type networks like the BERT networks, etc. All that needs to fit well on your hardware. 
Also, ML is a very active field, so you need a strategy to future-proof your solution as well. So I don't think you can have a success without some kind of programmable element in your solution. And that preferably that programmability should be simple to the end user. So not introducing a very strange uh, API or instruction set or something that is too custom. And I, here I mentioned this, you know, there are some low hanging fruits also to make something flexible and easy to use. So a configurable lookup table is a very simple thing to put in your hardware for future proofing, right? So that can be used for any unary function, i.e. any function of, of a single variable, like a typical activation function. You can just look it up, right? So that, that simple idea is a way of future proofing as well. And there are other techniques you can use as well for supporting sort of fairly general tensor level operations and things like that. Another important thing is to have support for debug and performance analysis, of course, uh, and preferable using existing popular tools. So that, that was my list of you know, really important features of a micro MPU. So now, and I would like to spend a little time looking at an actual MPU. So this is the micro MPU we recently built. It's called the Ethos U55 processor and it's the first ARM micro MPU for Cortex M based systems. Since then, we've actually la uh, also launched the U65, which is a, a larger version also supporting DRAM, but I won't, will not be talking about that. So the Ethos U55, it sits alongside as a uh, companion to Cortex-M host. Uh, it sits in a system where there's a system SRAM and a system flash. Flash is actually optional. You can run off completely from a system SRAM as well if you, if you want. It accelerates a wide range of networks. Normally for popular networks, the entire network is offloaded from the Cortex-M to the Ethos U. In cases where that's not true, the Cortex-M can, can do that uh, opera, operator that was not supported. So <clears throat> Inside the Ethos U55, there's support for this efficient weight compression scheme. It supports 8-bit or 16-bit activations and up to 8-bit weights, so 8 bits or lower. It has a configurability from 32, 64, 128, or 256 multiple, acute, multiple, multiple accumulate per cycle. And it supports the ARM trust zone for uh, security. So here is a view of the data flow when you run with the Ethos U55. So even before you boot, probably, you have put a pre-compiled -com network in your system flash. It's a command stream and the compressed weights used by, by that network. Something running with Cortex-M CPU, like a tiny ML application running TensorFlow Lite Micro, for example, is running here and puts activations into SRAM. It then sets up the Ethos U by giving the locations of these in memory. And once the Ethos U have those, it will start executing this command stream, reading activations and using a scratch buffer in the system SRAM completely autonomously running through the entire uh, workload. And once done, it fires and interrupts uh, back to the Cortex-M, uh, which then can continue the application. And uh, whilst the Ethos U is running, the Cortex-M could be put to sleep or it could do some other job. Uh, and, and vice versa, when Ethos U55 is done with the inference, it can be completely powered down as the, there is no internal state remaining uh, once the final result is put in SRAM. If you look at the interfaces, they're quite simple. So it has two XI manager, uh, managers, uh, one uh, read and write used for the SRAM in the system and one read only for the flash to separate traffic and make, make, the most, make it most efficient. It has the APB interface, which is a registry interface. This is where the host will set up the, the, the registers pointing to, for example, the command stream. It has handshake protocols to request and get clock and power called Q channels. Uh, 
and it has a single interrupt that fires when the job is done. So it's very, very simple actually from an interface point of view. So now let's take a look now more specifically at the, the flow when we add the software on top of this, and in particular the TensorFlow Lite uh, software framework. So to the left in this figure, we have the, the host uh, world, the offline, sort of yeah, offline, uh, and, and here to the right is the target device. So you begin to the left here with the TensorFlow framework, you, you tool your network into a tens quantized um, TensorFlow Lite file. And preferably you use pruning and clustering and techniques here to make a really, really good model here. That is no different from you know, any flow. This is what you know, TensorFlow uh, normally does. And you can actually take this uh, TensorFlow Lite file now and run it on your target device. And it will run, if you want, you could use the CMC and optimized kernels uh, or reference uh, kernels and will run on your system, just like that. So the difference when you have the micro MPU in your system is that you run it through an offline optimization tool, which will modify the TensorFlow Lite file, compress weights, actually making it smaller, remove, remove uh, things from the graph that can be run on the MPU. And when you run that instead, you know, networks like MobileNet or you know, all the popular networks will then completely run on the micro MPU instead but it will look to the application just like any other. Uh, it will complete, be completely transparent to the software. So this optimizer is called the Vela optimizer, and this is open source. And you could go uh, and have a look at it if you want. It's written in Python. What it does, it's to read a TensorFlow Lite file and identify subgraphs that can run on the micro MPU. So in the example here, you can see that there is a sequence in the middle with convolution, pooling, fully connected. And it's some operator at the beginning end that for some reason is not supported by the micro MPU. That then gets um, compiled into a, a custom operator here, but the, the other operators remain untouched in, in the tensor light file. The, comp uh, the compression of the weights is lossless, so you don't change any result by running uh, through the Velop optimizer. You get the same result before and after you run the micro MPU if you were to run this. Uh, and here is some effects you get. Like for some networks, just running this schedule uh, optimizer and, and using this cascading I talked before and other techniques, the SRAM usage when you run an uncompiled versus a compiled network can be up to 90% SRAM size reduction. And the compression can uh, be reduced the model by up to 70%. These are just examples. You know, it could be anything, but it really does enable networks that were not possible before in embedded systems to have, to have uh, this kind of micro MPU in your system. So let's take a look at a specific example. So this is one to letter a speech recognition network if we take a look first to the right here, we have the total result. Uh, you have a, an improvement 1,000 times the performance if you run with the U55 in the 256 MAC per cycle configuration. That is versus unoptimized code on running on a CM, uh, Cortex-M4. So maybe a little bit uh, unfair to not optimize the code. So if you do run with CMCCNN, there's a 3.5 times increase in performance here. Still, this is hundreds of times faster. And as I talked about before, uh, a companion, well, maybe I didn't actually, but there is, there is a, a Cortex-M55 is a, the newest Cortex-M with helium uh, vector extension set. So that's a significant gain over Cortex-M for 11 times, but still it's 20 time, 25 times faster. That's a significant gain by having a micro MPU in your system. So we're approaching the end of the presentation here. I'm not sure how I am on time. I hope it's okay. Uh, this is just me speculating or thinking a little bit about, you know, what, how will TinyM will change when you have micro MPUs in your uh, microcontrollers. So I want to say, yes. I have one question before mm -hmm. we go back to micro MPU. Here? So 
There's, yeah, there's this improvement that we get, right? What I'm really kind of thinking about is like in the three Vs that you have, right? The vibration, the vision, and the, what is it? The third one was yep. voice. What is it that's actually needed? Right? That's what I've been thinking about is like, what sort of performance is needed mm -hmm. in these kinds of applications? Certainly, you know, newer applications perhaps, but if we take keyword spotting, the person detection kind of things, you know, the benchmarks that are inside mm -hmm. DFI, what is expected in terms of performance in the real world today? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. So um, we're, uh, the way I see it, we're just enabling more uh, here. Uh, what is good enough is probably extremely depending on, on, on your application. So in, in particular for uh, voice here, I'm expecting that you, can, you would probably use all this uh, gain to have um, more accurate and more uh, um, advanced recognition of speech. So, uh, but, and, and, and also in the other solutions, maybe you would use the sort of the, old, the performance here actually to, to reduce power instead. So uh, you, you clock it down, uh, you, you make very custom uh, uh, implementation of this tuned to low power. So, it's just an, an enablement, really, of, of a lot of things. Uh, I would, and that is kind of what I was going to say with this slide. If, if that answers your question, it's a difficult question to answer, right? Yeah, I certainly, I certainly mm -hmm. agree. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you have to build it because it's only if you build it in the hopes that they'll come because they'll find that that makes a headroom that people need. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of it like, like today, if we take some of the more mundane tasks like what frame throughput or uh -huh. things like that that we did mm -hmm. that we yep. say okay well I'm more today really doesn't quite cut it we try and pack it in mm -hmm. but feedback from the we need something like an m7 but well we wish we could do it at the power envelope of an m4 mm -hmm. that's kind of the intuition i'm wondering if you could okay show. yeah so if, if if you talk about sort of the difference between different cpus compared to to having a micro MPU on the side, I mean, it's a dramatic difference. Uh, it's just, you're just gonna, gonna be able to do way more. It, it's, uh, it is really a, a, a magnitude better here. And, it, and whereas the difference between CPUs is usually in the percentages, right? So uh, also for vision, I mean, we, we can run mobile nets in, in you know, hundreds of frames per second, which is probably overkill. But you, what, what you can do instead is then to run it at the lower frame rate and, and, and as I said, be powered down and tweet inferences, right? So, so they will really just reduce the power. And what we've seen also is that, that for MPUs, actually, as you grow them bigger, uh, you gain in power. Uh, I mean, it, it, the power goes down as they go bigger because the, you can do even more reuse. Uh, uh, your max can be so when you read something can you you can you use all the max to re, re, um, for even more reuse and that lowers the the power per computation so actually you having a large MPU clock down makes sense right this is a strange property of of mm -hmm. neural networks that you actually gain by making it bigger in power mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as long as you power down between right you just run fast and stop um, yeah, and I, I hope I answered <laughs> your question, but uh... yeah, I kind of, uh, I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but I also mm -hmm. feel like there's an application perspective that perhaps does not come out straight from just looking at the hardware. Mm -hmm. um, so I agree that yes, you can do the run to idle and you'll get the efficiency gains there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to think of it as like, okay, well, you know, um, I mean, like if I do uh, the visual wake words model, like, mm -hmm. do I really need to be at like 30 frames per second cranking this thing away, for instance, you know? No, you um, probably don't. But what you can use the MPU, the MPU is probably still very efficient at doing that workload. And then mm -hmm. uh, as you have that in your system, once you've detected a wor word, for example, a wake word, you can use that MPU then to, to do full full-fledged speech, speech recognition and, and maybe mm -hmm. even speech generation and just, just 
enable stuff in your device that you couldn't do before, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's made, yeah, it does lower the power of the always on things, mm -hmm. but the really big thing is enabling new stuff. You know, by compressing things, you can actually fit the, the, the larger models uh, and they will run at a good speed and, and uh, acceptable power and you can now have more intelligence basically. So you, you do better stuff uh, whilst also consuming less power on the average probably because you're, you're always on also goes down. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that was basically, it's, it, it, it's a, a little bit on, in this section here, right? You, having a micro MPU enables you to run larger, more accurate models. So you have new use cases, high-end audio, Maybe you can also add simple vision on top of it. So when you wake up, you can check who, uh, recognize who said it. Is he maybe looking at you uh, or the device? So you know it's, you know, you're actually giving a command to me, right? Uh, or you're moving your lips. So, and, 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 you know, you can, you can, uh, you have more power, you can do more stuff, right? So probably you are, you, it would be a better application. Things like that. Gotcha. So, um, allows uh, a new energy, if, I mean, depending on where you put this, you can also use it to make uh, really small stuff more energy efficient, like briefly touched on it as well. So we will see uh, more and uh, better applications. That's the main uh, thing we will be seeing. I just want to say also that the micro MPU is such as we've seen that it's actually not only going to be used in, in this type of, of socks or uh, systems. We are seeing it being used a really wide range of implementations, all the way from custom SOCs, where you have a very specific use case and you fine tune everything for that, you know, clock down, low power, all these techniques for a very specific thing. Uh, versus more standard or better socks where you can pretty much run it. You don't really know when you design the sock where it's going to be used for. It's just efficient at AI and, you know, people will do whatever the application they want. Uh, we, it's also pre present in mobile socks as they have an always on island, right? So it's, I think it's already, you know, versions of micro MPUs are kind of already there. And, and, uh, and then also server SOCs actually plugged in, right? They still might need some intelligence to analyze the traffic. And because the micro MPU is so small and efficient, you can just chuck them in there. It's very small in, in those processes. So, the micro MPU, just saying, it's not only going to change um, the embedded, right? It's going to be used in many, like everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And also on the, on the topic of the future. So uh, the, I believe that the micro MPUs, there, there's going to be a trend towards standardization, but there's also going to be trends to customization, just my guess. Standardization, I kind of know, but uh, because there have been initiatives taken to standardize tensor operations. So a problem if, if you know, micro MPU become popular is that they do slightly different things. They might optimize in a way that, you know, you can, when you run something in a particular system, you get one result and something else on another, and, you know, it becomes a mess. So ARM has taken an initiative for something called TOSA, the Tensor Operating Set Act Architecture. And the intent of that is to have a standard uh, way of lowering networks to common defined set of operators, breaking it down into stuff that is well defined. So that you know that when you run a, a network that has been broken down like this, you will set, have the same result that way. So the compatibility framework for different systems. So it's very recent, but uh, it's gaining traction and, and we believe this could simplify both for the, the people doing applications and the people doing the hardware etc you know it's just generally uh, there to to accelerate this growth of billions of devices right uh, another thing we're seeing is uh, the opportunity to customize right so even if you have this standard some mpus will be better at something than others so if you know in the embedded world you're targeting even a particular uh, solution you could tune it for example if you were tuning for ether 255 you could know the compression scheme right you could make it really compressed by targeting that, right? If you want to. So maybe we'll see tooling doing that, right? Um, an extreme example of that is AutoML, which exists already today. 
So that kind of invents complete networks based on your data. So you don't just give it, give it data, train data, you know, and, and, and answers, uh, and it will come up with a good network. And we're seeing in AutoML already for, for smaller problems, it beats, you know, an engineer trying to pick, come up with a network. And maybe if you combine that with MicroMPU, you could give it some you know, a set of operators, this AutoML tool that the MPU is really good at, and you know, it will figure out not only the network but also a very good network for your target. So I'm seeing that as an opportunity to you know, you might see stuff like that. Another impact if we do get billions of devices out there, you know, I believe we are we will start going to to an improvement cycle, right? Once deployed, you will have lots of data coming in, uh, data will feed new ideas, um, and we will get better AI and things like that, right? So uh, I just want to highlight here the, the, the privacy concerns though, uh, if you imagine all these uh, devices out there actually gathering data to be used for uh, improving. I, I don't know exactly how to solve that problem, but uh, I still think it's going to happen, uh, you know, in, in the sense that uh, so somehow this needs to be solved. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm at the end of the presentation. Just a quick summary. Uh, key features of a micro MPU, uh, power efficiency convolutions, bandwidth efficiency with compression, low bit width, etc. The static scheduling, right? Uh, having everything pre-planned, not needing a cache, uh, ordering stuff perfectly for, for your target. Security and privacy, important. Comparability, flexibility, ease of use. That was the main, right? The Ethos U55 NPU exists. Uh, it's going to be in silicon soon. Um, from 32 to 256 Mac per CC, it has an open source Vela compiler you can use for a TensorFlow Lite micro framework. Uh, it's going to be other frameworks supported later, like TVM uh, or micro TVM. Uh, but we're going for TensorFlow Lite Micro as the first step. Uh, with Ethos U55, you can expect full support for the most popular networks. And in case you have an unusual operator or something, the strategy here is to fall back to Cortex M. And you can write your own custom stuff on your Cortex M if you want. And, and if, if in unusual stuff get popular, we will do seam season and versions of that, etc. That is our sort of roadmap for future proofing in this uh, product series. Expect less plan, uh, expect less need for flash and SRAM when you use the ETHOS U55 in your system and expect magnitudes of improvement over what you see on the cortex M, even the helium ones. Uh, impact opportunities just talked about more better use cases, standardization, more data. With that, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm open for questions and I'll try to answer them as best as I can. <laughs>